quickly. For those of you who need a certificate of attendance, please come back up front uh, at the end of the talk. Well, thank you for choosing uh, the IMA public lecture over the uh, Gophers game. <laughs> we will announce the score at halftime. Um, so, it's, uh, let me bring out my note here before I introduce the speaker. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Robert Greist. He's uh, one of the rising stars in the mathematical landscape. Rob uh, received his PhD from Cornell University uh, in Applied Mathematics in 1995, which is only a little less than 14 years ago. And his accomplishments since his PhD has been nothing short of spectacular. His work has been groundbreaking and highly influential, not only in mathematics, but also in the application fields. In 2002, while at Georgia Tech, he was awarded the National Science Foundation Career Award, which is uh, an NSF award, uh, what NSF's most prestigious award given to junior faculty, in their, in their words, who exemplify the role of teacher scholar through outstanding research, excellent education, and integration of research and education. He moved to Illinois in 2002, where he rose through the ranks to become full professor in 2007. In 2004, he received the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientist and Engineer, called the PKs Award, from uh, former President Bush, who just left office, if you saw on Tuesday. This is considered the highest national honor for scientists in the early stages of, the, of their promising research careers. So Robert is a very innovative uh, researcher who works, whose work also catches the eyes uh, of uh, the attention of the pop popular scientific community. In 2007, his paper with Vin de Silva was awarded the Scientific American's SIAM 50 winner, an award recognizing individuals or organizations who, through their efforts in research, are driving advances in science and technology that lay the groundwork for a better future. Since 2008, actually since August 2008, he has been at the University of Pennsylvania, where he holds the Andrea Mitchell PIK University Professorship. He holds an appointment both in the mathematics department and also in the electrical engineering department at UPenn. So we're very fortunate to have Robert here tonight. So please join me in welcoming him. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Glad that you can be here tonight. Can everyone hear me all right? Excellent, very good. So I'm gonna be talking about sensors tonight and mathematics. Now I'm a mathematician, which uh, makes you think that I'm gonna put lots of equations on the screen. Not so. Why, because this is a public lecture? No, because that's just usually not the way I think. I'm one of those mathematicians who tends to think in terms of pictures. Whenever I tried to figure something out that was complicated and I couldn't get it, I'd work and work and work until I had a picture in my head of how it looked, and then it made sense. So uh, I think what I'm gonna do tonight is give a talk that's mostly in pictures. This is a little experimental. What I did was I pulled out a camera or two and went around and took a bunch of pictures. Now I'm gonna talk about sensors. You might think I'm going to tell you about all these amazing sensors that you're gonna see in one year, five years, 10 years from now. I'm not that good at predicting the future. So what I'm gonna do is tell you about the sensors that are here right now. I did a little exercise in preparation for this talk. I pulled out the camera and I took 24 hours and I took pictures of all kinds of sensors that I could see. Now, when you think of sensors and you think of cool sensors for this fun talk, you're thinking uh, wireless uh, things that do all kinds of magical stuff. Well, there's a lot of sensors that are all around you that aren't all that magical, but they do things that are extremely relevant, extremely useful, and to people 100 years ago it would seem pretty remarkable. There are sensors on the wall, there are sensors underneath you sometimes. Maybe they're not our favorite sensors. There are sensors that sense all different types of things. This is a motion detector that's hooked into the alarm system in my house that senses many different types of things. It's connected to other sensors that uh, look for particulates in the air associated with my house burning down. I have other sensors in the house to detect for very different types of material that might be in the air. And again, we're used to these things. They seem very normal now. If 
but they're rather remarkable devices. I have a sensor in my house that receives signals from sensors placed and networked all around that wake me up in the middle of the night with a loud beep in case there's a bad storm coming. When my kids get sick in the middle of the night and I need to take their temperature, I pull out a sensor, stick it in their ear. Sensors are good at finding things that you can't see. Sensors are good for having fun. Did I mention fun? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And uh, let me add, I'm so glad that you're here tonight when you could be playing the Wii instead. The Wiimote is an amazing device. It has accelerometers inside of it that allow you to do the, the whole shaky shake thing. There's also optical sensors up at the front. It's, uh, it's a little hard to imagine, but just a few years ago, five years ago, the types of accelerometers that are in the Wiimote were prohibitively expensive. The technology is changing that quickly. As I understand it, and my interest in this is purely academic, you will understand, there are other types of sensing devices that one can plug into a Wii. My, my children tell me that there's uh, some, something like this that you dance on top of and it registers information. Now, if you've got a Wii, you've got a TV. If you've got a TV, you probably have uh, more remote controls than you know what to do with. Those, again, have sensing devices. The TV that it hooks into has sensing devices. Sometimes you want to get away from it all. So you press the button. The button magically does something with that sensor in your garage, and it says to uh, open the door. It closes the door again when you're done, but uh, that little optical sensor makes sure that it doesn't close on top of your car or your kid or your rake. Now, when you go to get inside your car, you uh, reach inside your pocket, you press the button, the sensors inside the car unlock the door. You better remember to do that, because if you try and open the handle and shake it too hard, the uh, car alarm is going to go off, and you're going to have all kinds of difficulties. You put the key in the car, and all kinds of sensors turn on and give you valuable information, such as, your door is ajar, or please fasten your seatbelt or please put more gas in the car because you're about to get stranded, or the car is about to overheat, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know about you, but I've outsourced that portion of my brain that used to be able to figure out where I am to the GPS device that connects to satellites that has all kinds of useful sensing information. If I get in the car and drive to the store, I go to check out, they use optical sensors to scan the tags to read how much money I'm gonna have to pay for those items, for that new Wii game, perhaps. I pay for it by pulling out a card, running it through a device that reads off the information, connects to my bank account, does all kinds of things there. The cameras that I use to prepare this talk are full of incredible sensors, sensors that would have seemed miraculous just a decade ago. Not just the, uh, the, the, the optical sensor that reads the, the incoming light, but all of the advanced processing that goes along with it that senses, for example, where a human face is, that reduces things like red eye, that uh, even focuses automatically so that I can take a halfway decent picture. The computer that I prepared this talk on is full of sensors. Perhaps you will remember the days when a computer mouse had a, a ball in it that you had to roll around and you had to get a special mouse pad. Those days are gone. In fact, the computer that I use to prepare this talk and to prepare my lectures is a tablet PC. It uses an electrostatic pen and you write on the screen. That's pretty cool. It's been a long time since I've uh, logged into my machine with an actual password. I tend to use the fingerprint sensor that I swipe my finger along, and it reads the fingerprint. Oh, let's see, the cell phone. Everyone knows about the iPhone and how you can, uh, you can turn it, and it's got accelerometers in it, and you can do all kinds of cool things. The iPhone is not the only one. The latest BlackBerry has accelerometers in it that measure what orientation the phone is in, and adjusts the display accordingly. Some interesting sensors inside of there. If you decide that you've had enough and you just want to get away, leave the country. Pull out your passport. 
Unless you have an older passport, your passport now has an RFID tag in it, a radio frequency identification tag with your vital data in it. And that is being broadcast and sensors can pick that up. By the way, if you do feel oversensed and feel like getting away from it all, don't go to London or Las Vegas. <laughs> is there anywhere that you can go to get away from sensors all around you? Well, no, not really. <laughs> there are sensors everywhere, all around you. Now, everyone knows how this works, right? You put your hand in front of the sensor, and you shake, 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 and you, you cuss, and you shake until the water comes out. <laughs> Stop shaking. It measures temperature. Just hold it still. You'll get it out. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Uh-huh. Yeah, take good notes. So I'm in the bathroom in the University of Pennsylvania computer science building with my big lens camera <laughs> down on my knees taking a picture of the uh, sensors. And I hear the door open behind me. And I think, all right, I'm going to have to talk my way out of this. And then I hear, hey, Professor Greist, what are you doing in here on the bathroom on your knees? And I said, I'm taking pictures. <laughs> and there was a pause. And then he said, cool. <laughs> See you later. <laughs> Sensors all around you. Well, this bathroom uh, is right next door to the robotics laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania, the GRASP lab, which stands for General Robotics Automation Sensing and Perception. And the GRASP lab is full of all kinds of cool stuff, like graduate students <laughs> and their computers. This is Nathan, who allowed me to come in and take lots of pictures of things like the messy desk in the robotics grasp lab at the University of Pennsylvania, and also the many, many very interesting robots that are scattered throughout. There are robots that roll around on the ground. There are robots that fly and coordinate to pick things up and move things. Robotics is all about sensing and actuation. You sense, you react according to what you sense, and you, you move things. You program work the way we program computers. And this robotics lab, like any of the really good robotics labs in the United States, has lots and lots of sensing devices in it. These are a variety of cameras that ring the top of the main oh, <laughs> cathedral, shall we call it. This is a normal optical camera. This is an infrared camera, which, if you uh, turn the lights out and fire them up, gives the room a nice spooky red glow that is useful for localizing the robots that are running around. There are lots of sensors that are on board the robots. This is a laser that is used to do range finding to, to figure out how far away the wall is so that you don't accidentally run into it. This uh, reddish sort of sensor up here is a very small pressure sensor that's on board one of the units. These are three-axis accelerometers like what you would see in a, uh, an iPhone or Wiimote or something like that. Let's see, this is a uh, magnetometer. We have power regulators here, which are full of interesting sensing. Now, those are just the kinds of sensors that uh, I saw over a 24-hour period, looking around at home and in the office. But that's not the most common sorts of sensors. The most ubiquitous sensors are the ones that you are using right now. Your body's full of sensors of various types and forms. And these are very, very different modalities. They're sensing different things. They work in different ways. And biologists are all about figuring out how these sorts of things happen. Now, these are all common sensors, things that some of them might have seemed miraculous five or 10 years ago, but they're very common to us now. What's going to come in the future? Well, again, I can't tell you 
so much about that. But if you just open up the newspapers, pretty much every week there's some new story about an interesting sensor that is either being developed or is being implemented in an interesting way. Just last month it was announced a single chip sensor that has better megapixel resolution than the human eye. That's something that uh, I found surprising, and I know a little bit about this. This is, uh, this is a couple years old now, Caltech's group coming up with radar on a chip. This is a complete radar system next to a penny. Can be used to localize nearby objects. How many people saw in the news this week the story that was out about the, uh, the iPod uh, Touch application? You strap it on the side of a high-powered rifle and you can use it to, uh, to, to aim better? Total coolness. That really makes me want to go out and buy an iPod Touch. <laughs> it really makes me want to go out and buy a high-powered rifle, too. So uh, moving along, this is a sensor that you might not have seen in the news. This didn't make uh, that ubiquitous of a splash. This is a sensor that you mount to a billboard, and it, uh, it takes uh, camera pictures, and it counts red dots. What do you mean, counts red dots? You know how when you, you take a photo of your kid and you get the red eye? Ah, when does that happen? It happens when they're looking right at the camera when it fires. Google wants this to figure out how many people are looking at the billboard so they can figure out how much to charge for advertising. Very creative idea for a sensor. Here's something that you're gonna be seeing more of in the future. This is a small RFID chip that is edible, that's approved for sticking down in your belly. Strap it to a pill, it measures, pardon me, it measures and registers how well the medication is being absorbed in your body and then wirelessly transmits to a sensor that you can say carry in your pocket. How am I doing? Okay, I'm doing all right. These are gonna become much more prevalent. There are sensors that both detect and detect via DNA. There are sensors that are used to detect very, very specific chemicals that can be used for a variety of purposes. Probably the number one application of embedded sensor networks that I'm aware of right now, maybe not number one, but pretty close to the top, is environmental sensor networks. Sensors that are used to do environmental monitoring, either of wildlife habitats or pollutants in a natural environment. Lots of interesting sensors being developed there. That stuff that's in the news now, what's gonna come in one year, five year, 10 years? It's anyone's guess. Well, what's the problem? Is there a problem here? Is there a math problem here? This is supposed to be a math talk. Well, there is. Most of the sensors that I've described are what you might call global sensors. <coughs> what do I mean by global sensors? I mean, you have a small number of very powerful, very rich sensors, very sophisticated sensors that get a big picture and that probably do a lot of processing with regards to that. They tend to be expensive, you don't want to lose them. Examples of such global sensors would be things like video cameras. That's a sophisticated object. You'd be bumming if you lost your video camera. Uh, you'd be bumming if you lost these global sensors as well. Eyes are biologically very expensive to produce. Your body doesn't make a lot of them, only makes two. And uh, you know they give a lot of information, they give a big picture. Now increasingly, as we are able to miniaturize, as we're able to shrink, we're going to see more of a trend towards local sensors. Sensors that just record a little bit of information about their surroundings, but you have a lot more of them. They're cheaper, they're more expendable, and they're tied together. Now biology has a mix of global sensors and local sensors as well. Your sense of touch is distributed all over your skin. These uh, sensors here are not connected to these sensors over here. And they're only giving localized information. And that's a good thing. Ow, someone is poking me in the arm. 
Now, the important thing about these local sensors is that they're, they're networked, they're tied together. They don't operate individually. They are not islands. They can communicate with their neighbors. And that presents a lot of problems. If instead of having one or two video cameras that give you a picture of the entire room, what if you have very, very small localized sensors that just give you a little bit of information of what's going on everywhere? How do you tie together all of that local data and get global understanding? That's a challenge, and that challenge is at heart mathematical. This is again the robotics lab at University of Pennsylvania. The day I happened to walk in, took a picture of the uh, whiteboard, and as it usually is, it's full of mathematics. It's full of calculus. And calculus is really one of the original tools for going between local information and global information. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about it, a derivative, or rather differentiation, is a localization operator. Right? You're taking something big, a function, and you're zooming in and getting information that's very local. It's a rate of change at a point. Uh, likewise, integration is taking lots of local data, rate of change here, rate of change there, rate of change here, and stitching it together or integrating it up to give you a global picture of a function. So calculus is, in some sense, the original tool for going from local data to something big. And integration, in particular, is a way to go from local to global. So can't we just uh, pull out the calculus book and solve all problems in sensor networks? Well, it's not that easy. Calculus was developed, oh, a little while ago, before we had sensor networks. And it's not necessarily adapted to modern problems in networks. So one of the things that we really need is a calculus, or calculi, that is or are adapted to networks. It's not just people in sensor networks who need this. Biologists need this as well. People doing data analysis need this as well. There's a lot of need for mathematics of understanding global ideas. Now there is another branch of mathematics that was specifically designed for answering questions about global phenomena. This branch of mathematics is called topology. How many people have heard of topology? Yeah, okay, first lesson, don't call it topology. You call it topology, people know you're faking it, right? <laughs> topology, let it flow, let it flow. So what do you know about topology? The first thing that anyone learns about topology is that uh, a topologist is a mathematician who can't tell the difference between the coffee cup and the what? Donut. <laughs> That's right. Why? Because the donut has a hole, and the coffee cup has a hole, and you can deform one into another. And that's what topology is all about. It's the study of spaces that are the same up to deformation or morphing. You can, you can morph stuff around. You can, you can stretch it, as long as you don't poke holes in it or cut it up into shreds. Now, that's an old saw about the coffee cup and the donut. What people don't know or don't appreciate is that a topologist can't tell the difference between a donut and a donut with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> this is the cause of much embarrassment at cocktail parties when a topologist shows up and they take your hors d'oeuvre that already has a bite out of it, thinking that it is whole. In fact, this is topologically the same as a complete and unmolested donut. I had so much fun making this talk, let me tell you. And this keeps going until, eventually, you eat through to the hole, and now the topologist says, hey, wait a minute, there's no longer a hole. You've, you've gone all the way through. This is topologically something different. But you get used to it. And then, in the name of science, or mathematics at least, we keep going until you get down to the very crumbs. And then again, the topologist wakes up and, and says, aha, this is different. It's no longer one piece. It's now crumbs. I was still hungry. So I cleaned up the crumbs. And again, that's something different. Nothing is different than something. OK, so that's cute, right? You did the donut and the coffee cup thing. OK, but how is that actually going to be useful in engineering, where you have to have results at the end of the day. 
One of the things that topology is built to do is to work when you don't have coordinates, right? You know, you're in pre-calculus class and you're plotting x and y and you gotta get the abscissa and the ordinates and all that. No, 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 nope. Not when you're a topologist. When you're a topologist, you don't care what the coordinates are because you're allowed to deform things. You're allowed to stretch things out. That sounds like it makes life more difficult. If you can do mathematics without coordinates, it's really good for when you want to do sensor networks. Now you're saying, yeah, but you just got done telling us about how we have these great sensors. We have GPS. We just put a GPS device on all these local sensors. GPS is not cheap. It'll get cheaper, but it's not cheap. Doesn't work underwater. Doesn't work when someone blows up your satellite or when you lose your satellite connection. It requires a lot of communication back and forth. There are all kinds of reasons why you might not want to rely on GPS for everything all the time. What if you could do things with less information without having to carry around a coordinate system anywhere? In the setting of, say, an ad hoc wireless network, this is what happens. A node broadcasts, and anyone in its neighborhood hears that broadcast, picks it up, sends a signal back, establishes a communication link. This happens with all its neighbors. And the nodes form a network. And even though nobody knows exactly where they are, no one knows exactly where their neighbors are or how far away they are, they just have some notion of close or not close. That's the kind of situation that topology was built for. Can you solve problems with just that amount of information? Well, let's think for a minute about what you could do without coordinates. Now, your mind is playing tricks on you at this point because you see the picture on the screen and you are seeing coordinates. I want you to get a good visceral understanding of what it's like to live in a world without coordinates. So I'm gonna need for you to help me out for a minute. I need a special assistant. I have a special assistant. What I want you to do is do what my special assistant tells you to do. So first, please stick your finger in your ear. <laughs> this has a purpose. <laughs> Next, I want you to cover your eyes. OK, one finger in the ear, one finger over the eyes. And at the count of three, I want you to say, in a soft voice, not too loud, I want you to say your name and listen around you. OK, one, two, three. <laughs> Simon didn't say. OK, you can, take your, uh, you can take your ears down. Thank you very much. You all look pretty funny. I wish we could have had the video camera on you guys. Now, what does that illustrate? That illustrates what happens in a non-localized network, because you can't see your neighbors. The only thing that you can hear is their name, their, their unique ID. Maybe we could do it with RFID tags, but just saying your name kind of works. Since you had one finger in your ear, you didn't have any directional information. You could not use directional hearing to figure out what was going on. Given that information, and that information alone what kinds of questions could you answer? Could you figure out, for example, where there are empty seats in the auditorium or where the aisles in the auditorium are? Where are there holes in the network where nobody, nobody is? You might care about this if uh, you're trying to figure out uh, is the cell phone coverage gonna work fine? When you're trying to figure out is my surveillance system going to pick up everything? Now, if you add coordinates, this would be easy. If you don't have coordinates, if you don't have distances, if you just have topology, what can you do? Algebraic topology and methods that, uh, well, we'll get into a little bit later, can give you answers to that problem. It can give you guarantees when you have coverage. It can say, yes, there are no holes, everything's good. Now, again, your mind is playing tricks on you because you look at this and you say, that. Well, look, just look at it. There's a hole. I see holes. That's because I'm drawing coordinates on the screen. Here's something that uh, is exactly the same problem, but your brain has a harder time figuring it out. Let's let things 
move around a little bit. Let's assume that you don't have enough sensors to cover a region. Okay, granted. But we'll let some of those sensors move around. Now the question is, if you were an evader, if you were trying to get away, is it possible for you to run, 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 and never get hit by a sensor as you move? Ooh, my brain's not so good at just looking at that and figuring it out. At the level of the mathematics involved, it's exactly the same problem. And algebraic topology, done properly, can give you that information when, again, there are no coordinates. As a function of time, you're just measuring who's close, who's not so close, and that's it. So what is this algebraic topology that I keep talking about? I was talking about donuts and coffee cups before. And again, topology is very visual, very pictorial. One thinks in pictures, I like that. But algebraic topology adds a lot of formal machinery to it, where you, you, you build algebraic structures. Algebraic topology is the study of objects that uh, take something topological, turn it into something algebraic. Let me give a visual demonstration. So I learned function machines when I was in school. Most objects in algebraic topology are function machines, or if you really want to impress your date, functor machines is a better word. So you put something topological into the machine, and what do you get out? You get out something algebraic. Now, it's not necessarily numbers. There's a lot more to algebra than just numbers, as you know. But I'm going to do one example of an algebraic topological construct that does spit out a number. This is a classical construction called the Euler characteristic. Again, poser alert, if you say Euler, <laughs> everyone will know you're faking it. <laughs> Euler, Swiss mathematician, 250 years ago. Euler characteristic is a number that generalizes counting. Counting, counting, I can do that. How many jelly beans are up on the screen? 11. 11, very good. So there are 11 blobs up on the screen. And I'm gonna think about those jelly beans as being zero dimensional objects, points, vertices, dots, nodes, whatever you like, jelly beans. Now I'm going to connect some of them together. I'm gonna draw one-dimensional lines or edges. Think of them as uh, communication links, think of them as physical edges, whatever. They connect to jelly beans together. Now, how many blobs are there on the screen? When I connect them together, I'm gonna think of that as one object. So instead of 11, I've got, uh, it looks like I've got eight. I added how many edges? Three, and I went from 11 to eight. So it's as if each edge counts as what? Negative one. Now if I keep going, I add two more edges. How many connected blobs do I have? Oh, I went from eight, two more edges, I went down to six. Yeah, each edge is like uh, a negative one. Now, where it gets really interesting is if I add some more edges and make a loop. Because according to this, these uh, three jelly beans, these three nodes, these three vertices have weight plus one. And then, uh, so I got one plus one plus one is three, but then I subtract one, subtract one, subtract one, and what do I get for this piece? I get zero. Indeed, it looks like a zero. And this registers the fact that, yes, it's one connected chunk, but it's got one hole in the middle. Now, if I filled that hole in with something two-dimensional, a face, then I say, oh, yeah, I, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six blobs. I was at what? One, two, three, four. These count for zero, these count for zero, and then I went up to six by adding two faces. So it's as if the faces have a weight of plus one. Oh, there's a pattern. Zero-dimensional things have weight plus one, the one-dimensional things have weight minus one, 
The two-dimensional things have weight plus one. Euler characteristic is what happens when you keep going. If you have a space that's built out of simple pieces, maybe called simplices, or just cells, blobs, whatever you'd like to call it, of various dimensions, we don't have to stop at dimension two, we can go higher, then if you take the number of zero-dimensional pieces minus the number of one-dimensional pieces plus the number of two-dimensional pieces, on and on, you get a number. This is called the Euler characteristic of your space. And the theorem that is very old and very lovely is that this is a topological invariant. No matter how you deform the space, no matter how you stretch it, you're not going to change this number. Now, why is that? It's because there's an equivalent formulation that registers this number as an alternating sum of the, the number of holes in your space. Ah, holes, that's, that's topology, coffee cup donut. The formal word that goes along with this is homology, which is the study of holes in a space of various types. Now, let's do some examples. That'll make it a little more concrete. Here's a tetrahedron, four-sided die. And uh, I'm going to look at the surface of this, the, 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 the outside, the frosting, if you will. That has a structure with uh, four corners, four vertices, so that's plus four. And how many edges? Well, if I draw them in, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, that edge along the back that you can't see. Edges count for negative one, so four minus six, that's negative two. And then how many faces on a tetrahedron? Any Greek scholars out there? Yes, four. So four minus six plus four equals two. Good. Remember that. Now, here is a surface. Look at the outside of this cube. Topologically, it's the same. It's just the outside of a ball. It's just what kinds of corners do you have? If I do the same thing, six vertices, 12 edges, how many faces on a six-sided die? Six, 12, uh, blah, 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 uh, it's two, it's two again. Indeed, showing that it's invariant, if I break it up into smaller cubes, do the math, I get the same number. If I break it up into still smaller cubes, or still smaller cubes, or still smaller cubes, I'm gonna get the same number, do that as an exercise. Even if I take something that's nice and round, like this cherry tomato, and I break it up into pieces, I've got one vertex where the stem comes in, and let's say I've got one edge that wraps around and comes back to where I am, and then I have two caps, the North Pole and the South Pole, as it were. Then the outside, the skin of that delicious cherry tomato, has one minus one plus two. Same deal. Okay. Well, what is this good for? Are there any sensors in here? This seems like uh, raw mathematics. Here's a problem. It's a toy problem. Has to do with counting. And so it's going to connect to this idea of Euler characteristic, which is a generalization of counting. And uh, counting's not hard. We count things all the time. I really do sort of mean toy problem but it is directed to an application. It's not just counting objects, it's counting targets, things that you really want to detect or count. It really is a toy problem. Think about that battleship game, right? B7, hit. That is a sensor. Hit, miss. You can't see what's happening, so you don't have perfect information, but you do have a coordinate grid. There's another game out there that perhaps you're familiar with that is also a sensor networks game. You've played this, right? When you click on a square in uh, Minesweeper, it tells you how many bombs are nearby. That is a sensor. It's a sensor that counts, but it counts with very little information. You don't, you're not told where the bombs are. That's what you have to figure out. You're not told the identities of the various bombs, you're just given a number. Now, if you think about it, 
Look at it from the bomb's point of view. Each bomb turns on some collection of sensors nearby. Think of that as a, a footprint for the bomb. And all of these footprints overlap in various ways, and what the sensor is reading is the depth of overlap. Keep that in mind. Now what I'd really like to do is have a big field of sensors that return numbers, just like in Minesweeper, that tells you how many target footprints it detects, how many targets are nearby. But unlike Minesweeper, I'm not assuming that the target is one hop away. It might be farther. You might not know the exact shape of a footprint. Even better, instead of having this dense field of sensors, I'd like to be able to do it with a sparse network where no one knows where they are, I don't have coordinates, that kind of stuff. Well, first, let's make an observation, and then we'll do a theorem. I have to get a little general here. Stick with me. We'll get to, we'll get to something interesting here. Let's assume that the targets are living in some, some domain, let's say this room. We'll call it the target space. Let's assume that my sensors are so dense that I'm parametrizing them by the plane. Let's say they're embedded in ceiling tiles or they're embedded in the carpet on the floor. And each target is gonna have some footprint, some region of sensors that it turns on. Contrary, each sensor is going to look up, sense how many targets are nearby, give a count, but not say which sensors it sees. It's measuring the depth of overlap of those footprints. Here is an observation that should be easy to prove for anyone who's had some calculus. Namely, if all of the target footprints have the same area, then the number of targets is what? You take the function that the sensor field returns that just gives you a count. You integrate that function with respect to area. If you're in uh, AP Calculus, you might have seen this written as dx dy as opposed to da, whatever. And then you normalize by the area of each footprint. Now why is that true? Think about the following example where all the footprints are disks of radius r. And I'm given this sort of overlap information. Now, if I think about this as a uh, stack of pancakes, what my sensor is telling me is how high is the stack of pancakes at any one point. What that integral is telling me is what's the volume of all the pancakes. If I divide that out by the volume of one pancake, and I know the volume of all the pancakes, I know how many pancakes there are. Simple. If you want a more formal proof, it would be something like this. I can represent this function h as a sum of functions that are one on the footprint and zero everywhere else. One of the things that you'll learn is that you can switch a sum and an integral as long as everything's finite, which today it is. What's the integral of a function that's one on some region and zero everywhere else with respect to area? It's just the area of that region but that area is equal to c. So this sum is really c times the number of targets over which you're summing. I like the pancakes picture myself, but we put in an equation for you. Okay, that's a simple observation. Now let's get to a theorem, and a real theorem. We're gonna do things the same way, but I'm no longer gonna assume that the sensors are on a plane. They could be parametrized by anything you want. Well, think a plane. Now, the target footprints are no longer assumed to have the same area, they're assumed to have the same Euler characteristic. That means you can deform those target footprints however much you want. Some of them are big, some of the targets have small impact, some of the targets have stretched out impact, as long as they have the same number and types of holes in them. Then, the exact same result holds. The number of targets is the integral of this function divided by, oops, that's supposed to be a C, not an N, minus five for Dr. Grice, divided by the weight of each target footprint. 
what's the one difference here? I'm not integrating with respect to area. What am I integrating with respect to? The funny XY thing, Euler, no Euler characteristic. I'm integrating with respect to Euler characteristic. What in the world does that mean? The same proof works, oh. <laughs> same proof works, except, oh, what's the one thing I forgot to say? I should have said, well, I should have said C here, and I should have said C is not equal to zero, because what happens if you divide by zero? Calculus police come and arrest you and take you away, goodbye. So, is that really a problem? Yes. Yes, there are sets of measure zero in this integration theory. This has Euler characteristic zero. It's a ring, it's an annulus. Does that really matter? I mean, look at this. Here's a collection of annuli, right? And, uh, right, the yellow is one and the green is two. How many annuli are there? It's not a trick question. How many annuli are there? Gotcha, it's a trick question. There could be four, or there could be two, or there could be six, or eight, or 10, or 12. You just can't tell when you're in this setting. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. Okay, let's explain this uh, Euler characteristic integration thing a little more carefully. Now, cake. In my house, whenever there's a slice of cake, there's a dispute over icing. Right, who gets the piece with the uh, biggest amount of icing? Child one is going to claim <laughs> this piece. Child two is gonna claim this piece. If what I know is the area of what child one and child two has claimed, how do I figure out the total amount of icing? Well, the total area is the area of this piece plus the area of this piece minus the area in dispute, as it were. Area respects this kind of formula, the union and the intersection. Now, this works with things other than area, right? It's budget time, and there's money on the table, and one constituency says, I'll take this much, thank you. Another constituency says, I'll take this, thank you. How much money is on the table? Well, it's the amount of money that constituent A, constituent B want minus the amount of money that they're fighting over. Euler characteristic obeys the exact same equation. This is a basic result in algebraic topology. And because it does the same thing that length and area and volume and money do, you can integrate with respect to it, you can build an integration theory just like you learn in calculus class, but it's all topological instead of analytic. Now this isn't an idea that originated here. This is an old idea. It was most prominently expressed in the topology community, although it goes back in its earliest form to ideas in geometry almost 100 years ago. It's shown up in questions of probability, although they've never used this language to my knowledge. They've just sort of implicitly seen it. And like any deep idea in mathematics, there are lots of ways in which it applies or crops up. And this application to networks and to sensing is another area. Now, why is this, why is this good? Why is this something that you couldn't do before? Word for the evening, Fubini. <laughs> Use it at your next cocktail party. If you're here with a date, try to work that into the conversation. Explain that it's Italian. <laughs> What's the Fubini theorem? The Fubini theorem says if you have a, a double integral, if you integrate with respect to x and then y, you can get the same result by integrating with respect to y and then x, right? I teach this to my calculus students all the time. Sometimes it's easier to go one way than another. Now, why is that uh, helpful? Well, this integration theorem obeys Fubini. That means sometimes integrating one way and then another way is helpful. Without doing all the details of the proofs behind it, let me show you how that theorem is applicable in a certain context. Boom.
Let's say that you have a network of sensors, and these sensors count booms. Uh, lightning strikes. And every time that sound wave passes over a sensor, the sensor says, click, I heard another boom. Let's say you have lots and lots of booms going on. The sensors will register how many booms they heard. From that information, and that information alone, is it possible to reconstruct how many times lightning struck? <laughs> yes, it is. And the result uses this integration theory and uses the Fubini. See, I've already used it once in conversation. And it even works if you have reflections and some other interesting things. Now, what's cool about this? There are no clocks on these sensors and no need to synchronize. No one remembers when they heard the boom or in what direction the boom came from. They just count, and that's all. And that's not much information. Next example, vroom. Let's say that you have vibration sensors embedded in the asphalt. Cars are driving overhead. Every time a car drives past, rumble, 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 and the sensor clicks. Ah, another car went past. No clocks, no keeping track of time, no synchronization issues. From that information and that information alone, even if the cars are driving around in funny paths, is it possible to figure out how many cars were driving around? The answer is yes, again, via this integration theory. The other reason why it's good to have an integration theory is because, well, you never have this idealized setting where there's a sensor at every point in space. You have a point here, a point there, a point over here. One of the things that you'll learn as you learn calculus and integration better is that Whenever you're in a situation with real data, you never get these nice functions like polynomials. You get data points, and you have to make do with that. And we have over 100 years of experience in doing so. That's called numerical integration. And we can do that. We can get algorithms that work even with this very sparse data. In the interest of time, I will skip through the last idea, which uses some more advanced notions in analysis, the idea of an integral transform that uh, you may or may not have heard of. The punchline is using some more sophisticated calculus-based tools. One can not only count how many targets there were, but one can localize them, figure out their, their sources, where those booms came from, for example. Since we're getting near to the end of the talk and I want to leave some time for questions, let me conclude by just stressing one point, the kinds of things that we can build with sensors are amazing. There's great work being done there in the engineering community, in the material science community, physics, chemistry, biochemistry, lots of amazing sensors out there. But it's not free and it's not miraculous. They can't do everything. You're always going to have a hard time getting GPS to work underwater. If we can solve problems with less information than you think we might need. For example, if you can uh, count things or localize targets based on waves passing over without having clocks or without having a GPS, well, why is that good? It saves power, and power is the, the, the ultimate strained resource in sensor networks. It saves time. You don't have to have so many graduate students changing batteries and little devices. And it also makes it easier for engineers to miniaturize an object if they don't have to worry about also miniaturizing the GPS device, for example. If we can take areas of mathematics that maybe haven't been so applied in engineering, like topology, and find good ways to make use of it, it's double bonus because not only do we have more tools available, because it's mathematical, because it's pure and abstract, it tends to be platform independent and doesn't depend on the, 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 the tiny details of this engineering system or that engineering system. And that generality and that robustness is really excellent. That's one of the virtues of mathematics, that it comes for free 
people in mathematics department doing nothing but pure thought, thinking that it's gonna be completely useless, turn around a decade later and there is their work being applied in real systems. Thanks very much for your attention. I'd be glad to take questions. sets of the distribution. Whoa, what does that mean? But you have some sort of uh, probability distribution. Things happen. And you want to know, what do I expect to see? Usually, that's answered quantitatively. I expect to see this number, this numerical data, that numerical data. You might also try to answer that question qualitatively. What kinds of shapes do I expect to see, for example? And some of the work pioneered by Adler and Taylor is answering that question using Euler characteristic and implicitly using integration with respect to Euler characteristic. They're not the only ones who have worked in that area. All those names listed up there were pioneers, and there's a long list of people doing uh, related work. You know, they may be familiar with the mechanics of integration with respect to Euler characteristic and just chose not to use that language. I don't, I don't know them personally, and I, I don't know. I, I suspect that they happen to uh, come upon this good idea and worked with it independently. But again, I don't know. Other questions? Yes? Well, I've noticed that the Office of Naval Research is included in your... Uh, That's correct. Does it have something to do with some sort of detection sensors under the oceans in some applications? Yeah, so ONR in particular is very interested in uh, problems where you're trying to sense things that are underwater. And uh, as I mentioned during the talk, some things are more difficult to do underwater. The way the waves attenuate is different underwater than in the air. Uh, trying to figure out exactly where you are is a lot more challenging underwater, above water. Uh, ONR has, and, and the Navy have, a pretty wide perspective of sensors that they work with and sensor problems that they deal with. Um, what I'm talking about is, is a very small part of a larger grant program that I'm working on uh, with DARPA. This is one particular aspect. Yes? Uh, can you, coming from a sensor network community, can you define the localization problem that we are referring to that we do not have uh, GPS access? So you have sensors, not GPS. <coughs> and what else do you know? What, what, is the, what, what other assumptions do you have? So are you referring to the... Let's uh, say what the problem that you are alluding in number of times. The thing that I uh, flash at the end using integral transforms? Okay, so, so what's the, the problem state? This would be a setting where you have a dense sensor network. Yes. The only thing it does is count how many targets are nearby. No localization information on the targets, no bearing information on the targets. The assumption that I didn't tell you up there is that the target supports are soon to be convex. Not round, not uniform. So they can have different sizes, different shapes. Given those assumptions, and those assumptions only, I can tell you where the centers of those convex sets are. Yeah, and the graph is connected with the sensors. So everybody can eventually learn. Well, the characteristic is distributable. So what do I mean by all this? I mean that this, <laughs> this quantity that you compute only relies on the information that you need talking back and forth with your neighbors. 
You don't have to have a Dodd-Side perspective to compute the Euler characteristic. It's combinatorial. So integration is also local, right? If you want to know the integral of a function, you can get it from local information and patch together those local integrals, add them all up, you get a global integral. So it's not a centralized computation. So, in the localization problem that I just mentioned, it's not entirely necessary to have your sets be convex. If you break that, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but I'm saying it's going to be a lot trickier to figure out just what you mean by the, the center of the set and where that target is emanating from. We don't have to solve the localization problem. You just say how many targets are out there. No. I claim that I can figure out the centers of those target footprints. And if you work under the pretty mild assumption that the target is at the center of the convex set, then you will be Now, full disclosure, that last portion that I put up using integral transforms is not published yet. It's not even written down completely yet. <laughs> this is very new stuff. Yes? I understand that we are talking about a set of network entities. The first job is counting, correct? That's right. Now, I also understand you can use these <laughs> numbers to figure out where a center is, for example. Yes. How is this? <laughs> Exactly. You have to think of the bound of the error before you apply this network words for the system as a coordinates. Because you're talking about the model that has no coordinates, how do you go between the two? That's right. Tell me what the error is. Computing error bounds is very subtle in this integration theory. This is not like the normal integrals that one is used to dealing with. Even though mathematicians have been studying this way of doing integration for decades. To my knowledge, there's exactly zero work that's been done on how to do numerical integration in this theory. So computing good error bounds is very much an open issue.